right, let's turn to our text we've been working on, Romans 8, 28 through 30, and let's recap a little bit, and then we'll dive into our sermon tonight's going to be called, What Now? What happens after the glorification process is finished, we're calling it the big picture, what's really going on? Y'all know what the big picture is? So Romans 8, 28 through 30, Paul uh, is talking about uh, three verses that I think are the most awesome three verses in the entire Bible. They radically changed my life when I studied them. Based on these, it brought me to a conclusion that once a person is truly, truly born again, it's truly born again, and they've been regenerated, then they're saved, and they'll always save. They can't lose their salvation. Uh, that's my position now. It could be wrong, but that's just where I'm at based on my studies. The key is, are you truly born again? A lot of people think they're born again, but they're not really. So he says in Romans 8, 20 through 30, we're talking about the doctrine of predestination or the elect. Paul says, and this leads up to this, he says, and we know, Paul assumes that they already know this, we are assured, have confidence that God, the sovereign God of the universe, I mean, there's no strange coincidences with God. God who is sovereign, right now is causing all things to work together for good, fitting into a divine plan, a predetermined plan or predestined, or predestined destiny or purpose for those who love God and those who are called according to His purpose. So we've got a promise there that God, the sovereign God, is somehow making all things working together for good. He takes our messes and he turns them into a message and we blow, we blow up plan A, then he goes to plan B, and then we mess up plan B, he goes to C, and for whatever reason, God is sovereign and he's able to make these things work together for, but based on, but it's only applies to two people, people that love God, and people that are called according to that predetermined destiny or purpose that God has. So he goes on to say, for those whom he foreknew, those who he were, was aware of, and those that they loved beforehand, <coughs> he predestined, predetermined, or foreordained them at the very beginning <coughs> to be conformed to the image of his son. The Amplified says to have a shared inward likeness so that we might become the firstborn among many brethren, the adopted sons of God. <coughs> and those <coughs> whom he foreknew he predestined and those he predestined, he called. And those whom he called, he justified. And those he justified, he glorified. This is all past tense stuff. So let's look at our little timeline again. The Trinity. Met before the foundation of the world, and they fast forward the page, they looked on human all through eternity. For whatever reason, they looked at all the people that would ever be created, and for whatever reason, just because God chose to, we don't know what why he chose, why he didn't chose others. And he fast forward the tape and he saw that there were certain ones, okay, that he for whatever reason he loved them beforehand. There's something about them that he loved or for him. 
he foreknew them. He had a foreknowledge about them, a prior knowledge about these people. They weren't even created yet, but they were able to see it. And based on that foreknowledge, whatever it was, it wasn't based on our performance. This is what's amazing about grace. This is what, this is what should make you feel special. But those individuals that he loved beforehand, he predestined or had a, or he preordained, predetermined them to be conformed to the image of his son. So, somewhere along that line, those people that were chosen were born. Then they were called. Many are called, few are chosen. The, the offer of salvation goes out to everybody. God loves everybody. He doesn't desire that any perish. He desires all to be saved. But in reality, there's only few that are going to actually end up responding. That's called the, the general call is for everybody, but the effectual call are those people that end up responding to what was determined ahead of time. So somewhere, uh, God saw me. For whatever reason, he chose me. I wouldn't have chose me, but he chose me. Well, I don't know. Then I was born. Then he called me sent the call from heaven, and that somewhere I responded to the call, and then somewhere I was justified. And then that process was finished, and then I was determined that I would be glorified. So we've got present our past salvation, which is justified, that's where we get our imputed righteousness. Romans 5 and 1 says that we've been justified, or having therefore, past tense, it says, having therefore, past tense, been justified, acquitted, declared in right standing with God. Uh, yeah, we are in right standing with God. And then, when we're done, then... When we're done, we're going to go to heaven, and that's going to be our final salvation. And that's where we're going to be like Him, and we're going to be transformed and have our new bodies. So in the meantime, there's this process going on called sanctification. It's the process where we're being conformed to his image. So we were all created in God's image and God's likeness. God knew all this. <laughs> he knew he would fall. That Adam and Eve would, would sin. He knew that was going to happen. They knew that was going to happen. They came up with a plan, a predetermined plan and purpose uh, that these people that were chosen would all fall, fall short of the glory of God, his character, <laughs> and that they would all need to be restored, conformed back to him, so that's what the, the final ultimate purpose of mankind is to be restored back. And so this is why this process is going on to conform us back to this image. And when this process is done, then we're going to graduate and then we're going to go to heaven in our glorified bodies. Philippians 1.6 says that God, Paul says, I am confident, convinced, fully assured, absolutely certain that he who started a good work in me or chose me before the foundation of the world, who started that good work, will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. He will continue to carry on that work, that predetermined purpose, this, this process of being, that he's going to oversee this process, uh, and he's going to carry out that process uh, up until the time he returns, developing us, developing character, perfecting us and bringing us to a full completion. So we talked last week, but we had the, we had the, the, the Godhead who created us, the triune activity about the Father, Son, and how they're praying for us as we go through this process. They're praying and seeing to it. And they've also made this decision that there's like a big hand coming down from heaven where they are uh, seeing to this plan that is carried out and brought to its full completion so that we'll end up finally having been just. So all this was determined beforehand. 
And it's all past his. It's called the golden chain. Those he foreknew, he predetermined, then he called, he justified, and he glorified. So this was all decided before the foundation of the world. And it was decided that we would all eventually, when this process is done, we would end up in heaven <coughs> and be glorified with him. <coughs> so, it shouldn't make you want to go out and drink and drug tonight, should it? Uh -huh. Should be hooping and crawling. So tonight we're going to look at this process of glorification. This is our final salvation. When this process is complete, then we're going to die, we're going to go to heaven. First Corinthians 15 says, 15, 52 through 53 says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, a trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised from a perishable body to an imperishable body, and we'll all be changed. Will go from being mortal to immortal, immortality. So, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, something's going to happen there, whatever, when we all die, or when it comes back to get us. So, we're going to move from the earthly realm to the supernatural realm, from the temporary to the permanent, from the earthly to the heavenly, and there we're going to be for eternity. The sign for eternity is this. So then what? What are we going to do in heaven? Are we going to be floating around on a cloud playing a harp? Are we going to be casting our crowns? Are we going to be worshiping God? Holy, 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 holy. When there's some things that the Bible says that we'll be doing, then, but uh, there's a whole eternity it's going to be out there. The average man lives 76 years old and then he dies and he goes to heaven or hell and then he'll be there forever and forever and forever and forever and forever. But when will that end? It won't. That's what sovereign, sovereignty and the leg, this is what blows your mind. when you. This is part of what I'm doing this tonight. I want to blow your mind tonight. <laughs> I want you to, you know, eternity is we're already eternal beings. We're either going to go to heaven or we're going to be in heaven forever and forever. It's never going to come to an end. But when is it going to? You know, there's got no. It won't. Well, so where did God come from? Well, He's forever been there. Yeah, but He had to kind of like start somewhere. He's always been there. I mean, that just blows our minds. So what was going on before? I mean, God was doing things. We don't even know what that was. But how, but think about that. I mean, if he always existed, don't you think perhaps that there was a whole bunch of other stuff going on? You know, for billions and trillions of years, I mean, he may have had another gospel, another plan. I mean, this thing could be huge. We don't know. But we're limited to, you know, that God created the earth. And then after that. So tonight we're going to go with what we know, but we know that when we get here, one of the first things that's going to happen is there's going to be a wedding. God, uh, the Father, has been preparing Jesus, the bridegroom. And then when we're all done, Revelations 19.7 says, Let us rejoice. And be glad and give glory to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come. The bride is ready. She's looking good. She's smoking hot. She's ready. She's been being prepared. She's been down here going through all this stuff and all this stuff and all this stuff. And now when she gets here, she's going to be done. And the wedding's on. And then we're going to come and then we're going to be the bride which are the sons and daughters of God, the true family of God. There's going to be a holy matrimony, a joining of these two. And then, 
Show us a picture. Is it, don't you get that picture? Here's a picture. Can you blow that up a little bit? But those who he foreknow, he, he called. Here's, here's this earth of all these people. And these people that have been elected, hand chosen, hand picked, hand selected. You know, we don't know exactly who they are. In all of creation, it says in Romans 8, that are waiting for the revealing of who these elected, who are these sons of God. Everybody's sitting behind the big, huge curtain of eternity. We're all in our seats. We're waiting for the veil to be torn and the revelation, the revealing of who are those that, that were elected? Who are those that survived? Who are those that lasted? Who are those that they chose? And we don't know who they are. A lot of people think they are, but they don't really know. So you got a grouping together of these people, and when they're done, they're going to go and be the bride and join Jesus in heaven. So are you getting ready? Are you are you developing yourself? I mean, if you are a, a woman waiting for a husband. And you, you, you would be not just working on looking good externally, would you? Hopefully you'd be working good internally. That's where we fail to drop the ball. The husband at the same time waiting on his bride should be getting everything ready. Jesus has already got everything ready. He's just waiting on all these people to come to the end so that so when the gospel is preached to all of humanity and it's all said and done, and then he can get on with his wedding. So there'll be a a joining together in a wedding, and then there's going to be a, then what? It's going to be an eternal romance. This is why marriage in heaven is, is not going to exist. Jesus is going to be our eternal companion, our divine romancer. So we're going to have an eternal romance with Jesus. Gene Edwards writes a book about, about the, uh, the uh, divine romance, the divine plan of, of the, what this honeymoon is going to look like forever. So after the honeymoon, or, but it's going to be an eternal honeymoon, but there's also something else that's going to happen up here. After the honeymoon, then we're going to be sent out into eternity. And what are we going to be doing? Okay, we'll be having a love affair forever and forever, but there's three things that we do know. Uh, one, if you turn to Revelations, Revelations 1 6, Revelations 26, all say, Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will become priests of God and of Christ, some versions say kings and priests, and they will reign and rule for a thousand years, and they shall be ministers of God. So, one of the things that we know is that we're going to be priests. <clears throat> ministers. Well, what do priests do? Priests serve, so we're going to be serving in heaven. Imagine that. Why do you think we need to learn to serve down here? <laughs> so we can be a good servant up there, right? Yeah. It also says we're going to be priests and we're going to be ministering. Who are we going to be ministering to? It's going to have to be people. And then it says we're going to be kings. I mean, you know, a king is not a king unless he has a kingdom to rule over or people to rule. Bob Crow, one of the experts on revelations that used to be at Duncan, talked about this. And we don't know for sure, but think about this. That if the, if the universe is expanding, and do you think perhaps that maybe he'll be creating more and more people? After this, and a whole different thing, maybe <laughs> angels or whatever. But either way, uh, we're going to be priests serving, or we're going to be ministering to somebody. We're going to be kings. That means we're going to be sitting on a, a, a throne, and we're going to be 
having a kingdom of people that we're supposed to rule and reign and, and over. Brother, you're going to be sitting in heaven one day on a throne, okay? Being a king. Think about this. And it says, then we will be also judges. Matthew 19, 28 says, And Jesus said to them, uh, the disciples said, Hey, you know, we've left home, we left mom, we left everybody. What's going to be in it for us? What's in it for us if we do all this? And he says, Let me tell you what's going to be in it for you. He said, There's nobody that's left their wife and their family and husband and all these different things that will receive what? A hundred times more in this life than in the next. So can you imagine what the next? And it says... And you who have followed me in the regeneration, that means in the, in the return, when the Son of Man, he will sit on his glorious throne, and you also shall sit upon the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So, if you're a judge today, you've got to be pretty educated and pretty smart, don't you? To be able to make decisions. You've got, you got to have wisdom. So think about this. If we're going to be spending eternity serving, we better learn to serve. If we're going to be spending eternity ministering to people, we better learn how to care about other people and minister. If we're going to be spending eternity being kings, we better learn how to rule and reign with and use authority in the right kind of way and be able to make decisions over people and kingdoms. Kings. And we're also going to need to have wisdom to be able to make uh, judicial decisions in heaven. That means we're going to have a delegated authority in heaven to make uh, decisions. So, 2 Corinthians 5.10 Love this. There's two judgments when we die right here. We're either going to go to heaven or we're going to go to hell, right? Not but two places. First judgment will be the great white throne of judgment. That's going to be the sheep and the goats. That's where he puts the sheep on the left and the goats on the right. The sheep go to heaven and the goats go to hell. And then after all that is determined and this bride of Christ is put together, we all get up here that there's going to be another judgment called the Bema Seat. And everybody is going to come and have to stand before God. Everybody is going to have your day in court. How many of you ever had to stand before the judge and you're not sure how it was going to go for you? Yeah. <laughs> Fear and trembling. You know? Well, every one of us, this is the Bema seat. Now, this is only for Christians. Okay? This is not determined whether you're going to go to heaven. This is a reward ceremony or a banquet that is going to determine uh, you know, what your eternal reward is based on your performance while here on earth. Listen to what it says. We must all, every single one of us, must appear before the judgment seat, the Bema, so that each one of us may be recompensed for the deeds that he did in the body. That means while here, he was here on earth. According to what he has done, good and the bad. The Amplified says we must all appear and be revealed or exposed for who we really are, the works, before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive his pay or his reward according to what he has done in the body, whether good or evil, considering what his purposes have been, what his motives have been, what he has achieved, what he's been busy with and given himself to in his attention accomplishing it. I won't go into this too much, but 1 Corinthians 3, 13 through 15, it's not up here, but it says, on that day, each one, each man's work will be exposed or become evident or revealed for the day, that means that day, the Bema seat, the judgment day, will expose the man. It will show it because he is revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. 
If any man's work which he has built on remains, he'll receive a reward. And if any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved. That means he'll get in heaven, but barely. <laughs> the Amplified says that his works will become plainly, openly revealed and exposed, shown for what they are, the true nature of what those works were. For that day of Christ will disclose it and declare it, because it will be real with fire. And the fire will test and critically appraise the character and worth of each man's work which we have done. So while we're down here on this planet right here, those that he foreknew, those that he predetermined, those he called, those he judged, we've been down here with an opportunity. And some of us have done good things, some of us have done bad things. I mean, you're wasting a lot of years out there in the, in the saloon. Yeah. Okay. How many have done a lot of things but done selfish motives? How many have done a couple good things? Either way, there's going to come a day where we take like a wheelbarrow. <laughs> Everything that we've done, there, all the days of our lives, as the world turns, all the days of our lives, like sands through an hourglass, all right, all the day, we're going to go with our little wheelbarrow, and we're going to have our turn, and we're going to stand, and there's going to, it's going to go into a fire. On that day, there's going to be a fire test, and when all the works are going this fire, and the works that we've done in the flesh are going to burn up. No reward, waste of time. Those works that were done with the right motives, the right purposes that were done for him, those will survive. They'll go to this side, and then they'll go with us to heaven. And then based on what those are, we'll determine what our admission and assignment is for eternity. So we're all going to be priests, kings, and judges, but there's going to be levels of heaven. There's some people that aren't going to do nothing. They're going to barely make it in at the last moment, like the parable in the vineyard of the guys that went out and worked in the fields. Some worked all day long, some worked one hour. They all got to heaven, okay? But they got the same reward, which was eternity. But how I many know when we get to heaven, things are not going to be equal? There's going to be a front row, there's going to be a back row, and a whole bunch of in between. And what we've done down here is going to determine, we're all going to be these, but it's going to determine our eternal assignment that we're going to be sent out to throughout eternity. Where are we going to go? I don't know, I mean eternity. Apparently there's going to be a lot to do. Let me blow your mind about the right now there's an estimated two trillion known galaxies and an estimated between 6 and 20 trillion galaxies. There's 8 billion people on the planet. If you divided just the known, 2 trillion, that we know of for sure, and divided by 8 billion, that would give everybody 250 galaxies each. So what will we be doing? We'll be sent out to galaxies, you know. I mean, I could perhaps, based on my reward, I could maybe have uh, three or four galaxies. Someone who's awesome like Miss Jamie or someone like that, she might have, you know, 150 galaxies. Or, you know, Miss Jackie, I think she's up there probably getting ready to be, she was joining her husband. She was single a long time, you know what I'm saying? She just got married. That, that man's never going to hurt her. He's never going to abuse her. She's going to have the man of her dreams, her knight in shiny armor, baby. And they're going to be sent out in eternity. Jackie's probably done print. She was ready. She finished herself. She was done with her assignment. God graduated her into glory. Now up in heaven, I mean, I just, I'm not grieved about Jackie. I'm excited. I mean, she's getting ready to spend an eternity with Jesus, and then she's going to go on an assignment somewhere. All based on how she did, and I think her reward will be pretty good. Well, how will your reward be? Let me tell you our Milky Way. Our Milky Way is 100,000 
light years across. This is just one galaxy, the Milky Way. Get my stats here. 100 light years. Well, how long is a light year? A light year is how far light travels in one year. You turn on the light in this room, and that light would move at, uh, at, at uh, what's it, uh, 300, 186,000 miles per second. Light. You turn on the light, and light moves at 186,000 miles per second. Pretty fast, huh? So if, our, if, if a light year is how far light goes in a year, it's how far light would go in one year, it would be 6 million million times 100,000. So if you got into you got into a, a spaceship right here, and you put it in four wheel drive, and you sent this spaceship at 186,000 miles a second. Can you imagine that ride? What warp would that be? <laughs> it blows my time warp continuum. <laughs> If you got in this and you started going around this and you made one revolution back to here, it would take you 200 million years. And there's perhaps 6 to 20 trillion of these. And it's still expanding. Back when God created the earth, he said, let there be light. He spoke, he said, let there be light. And light came out of his mouth at 186,000 miles an hour. And yeah, there was a big bang, all right. <laughs> and it exploded. And boom, Milky Way galaxy. Boom, another galaxy. Boom, suns and planets. And, and they say today that the universe is still expanding. So in another 100 years, there may be 30 trees. And then 100 million years from now, they, we couldn't even comprehend it. So I said all that to say, we, have a, we, we got a lot to live for, a lot to do. But what you do down here is going to determine what your assignment is here. So you better get busy with doing good things down here. Let me read you a really good one, Matthew 16. Twenty-four through twenty-six. Jesus is talking to his disciples. One of them was not called. One of them wasn't elected. That was Judas. The rest of them obviously <clears throat> were. And he's talking to them about discipleship. You know, about laying down your life. Okay. And he says. If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Amplified says, if anyone desires to be my disciple, that means my disciplined follow, not a Christian, he must deny himself, disregard himself, <coughs> lose sight of, forget himself, forget his own interests, take up his cross, and follow me. That means to cleave steadfastly to me daily, conform wholly, be restored back to my image, to my example, that means my character in your living and in your lifestyles and your habits. Be holy, for I am holy. If need be, also be willing to die for it. For whoever wishes to save his life shall lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake shall find it. The word is bent on. For what will a man profit if he gains the whole world and yet forfeits his soul? Or what can be, or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Or what could be more important than his man's soul? Right here, my outer man is decaying, it's dying, it's going back to dust. But my character is being developed, it's being prepared, it's going through the recovery process, it's going through sanctification. 
Some days I work hard at it, some days I'm not. But either way, that process is going to be done. And when I get to heaven, it's going to have an eternal... The only thing that's going to be in eternity is our soul, our character. Are you with me? This is why proven character is so important. So what benefit, what profit is it for a man to spend his whole life down here on himself, being selfish, doing whatever he wanted, being his own God, and then yet forfeit his soul? Now what's cool about this is that word forfeit does not mean go to hell. Okay? This is referring to, to Christians. Jesus says, man, if you know, uh, think of the big picture here. You know, you know, you're not just Christians. You're supposed to be disciples. You're supposed to be working on your character. You're supposed to be prepared. You're supposed to be getting ready for your wedding. But yet you're over here goofing off and going through program after program, doing all this crazy stuff. You're wasting the time. You're out of the process. And it's going to cost you in the long run. So what good is it to spend your whole life down here and then all of a sudden the word is forfeit, your soul in heaven. The word forfeit means you get to heaven, but when you get to heaven, your character is damaged, underdeveloped. It's far short of what it could have been because you failed to respond to the opportunities. So we're going to be judged by everything we've done, everything on our plate, you know, how well we did with what God gave me, not what he gave everybody else. Remember the parable of the, the, the talents? He gave one to some certain ones based on their abilities, what they should have been reasonably able to do, and their reward was based on how well they performed what was given to them. And so we're going to be judged by what's been given to us. I'm going to stand in this line, and my works are going to go through the fire. My mama's not going to be there. My daddy's not going to be there. The only thing that's going to be there is my soul pushing a wheelbarrow. No gold, no diplomas, no uh, smarts, no nothing. It's just my works are going to be evaluated. And those works that survive this fire will go on to me and be determined by character. So the word means not, the, not someone that goes to hell, but it means the soul that gets to heaven. When he gets to heaven, the word is uh, uh, alienated. It refers to a black sheep, for example. You get into heaven and, you know, you, uh, all of a sudden you get up there and, you know, you see all these white sheep that are developed and beautiful in character. Spotless, unblemished lamb. And all of a sudden you get up there and you're a sheep, all right, but you're not as white and as pretty as those other ones. You're not the best looking bride in the world. You're different than the others because you did not develop yourself, maximize your productivity while you're on earth, and then you do get to heaven, but you suffer loss for eternity. It's the same word that refers to your works going through the fire. Those that, work, those that get through will, uh, uh, will go to heaven with you, and those that don't will burn up and suffer loss. Same word. So my whole point tonight is what we do down here is determining what we're going to do there. So let me ask you, if you died tonight, the big, how would you do? We're supposed to be investing in things of eternal value, not in the things of this world where moth and thief can so We're supposed to store up treasures in heaven. We're supposed to be doing good works to get an eternal bank account where our soul can enjoy for eternity. <laughs> so we got, we're, we're, we got a bank account up here too. A dowry, so to speak. Jim Elliott, that was one of the mm. guys that several of the missionaries that went into Ecuador back when it was a jungle. They all moved to Ecuador with their families. I mean, they all had kids running around and and they literally said, had a day where they all said goodbye to their families because they knew they weren't coming back. And they, they were they had been flying over in a heli in a, in a plane. <laughs> throwing food out to kind of get, get things going. But then they decided it's time for boots on the ground, and they knew boots on the ground. Anyway, they went into boots on the ground, and they all were martyred, killed. Later on in life, he had left something in his journal that his wife read and says that, he says, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he simply cannot lose. He said again, 
You ain't no fool, man, if you give up what you can't keep anyway to gain what you cannot lose. Whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses my life will find it. That word lose life means to play it safe. That means what it says right down here. If you want to play it safe, you've got all the things you want to do. You don't want to serve. You don't want to give back. You don't want to develop your character. you got your fire insurance. you got to get out of hell free card. You may be saved. You may not be saved. But if you save and you go into life with that attitude, you're going to be a loser. So you have a choice. You can spend time down here on you or you can spend time with eternity. That is the big picture. Amen? Amen. Amen.